In the early hours of this icy London morning, I remind myself of a quote from the poet Shelley, a line from Peter Bell III, written in 1819. The quote, Sometimes the devil is a gentleman. I recall the tales heard so often as a child, the many books written on the subject. Perhaps the most notorious unknown killer in history. Certainly one of the most thorough. He stalked women in the dark, only certain types of women. His calling card came in the shape of a mutilated corpse. His signature unmistakably called Surgical Steel. I am once again reminded that a cunning psychopath armed with surgical knowledge and a razor-sharp scalpel can tear a human life apart in a very short time indeed. I seek the truth about just such a man. It began August 31, 1888. By the second week of November of that year, the hideous legend had become a global topic. Many questions were raised, the most enduring of which has haunted me all my life. Just who was Jack the Ripper? Was he a lone killer bent on revenge? Why did he strike only prostitutes? And why did the killings end with the fifth victim? On this walk through an isolated forest, I carry with me a book which has brought me halfway across the world. There have been many manuscripts theorizing on the Ripper case. But in the few days spent poring over this particular book, I became convinced that the author had at last presented the dark truth. As for the book I carry with me, it is called Jack the Ripper, The Final Solution. The author is to this point known only to me by a few frantic telephone calls made at the most preposterous times in the early morning. His name is Stephen Knight. He lives not far from where the murders took place. His trek toward the truth began in September 1973, when, as a journalist for the East London Advertiser, he interviewed a man who would light the spark. The Advertiser was the lone surviving newspaper covering the area of Whitechapel, Jack's favorite prowling ground. The subject of Stephen Knight's interview in 1973 was a man named Joseph Sickett, son of the renowned Victorian painter Walter Sickett. An interview with the son of an artist is not what one would usually call earth-shattering material. But when the specter of Jack the Ripper becomes synonymous with the man's story, suddenly a whole new light blazes from the void of unanswered questions. My name is Ray McGregor, seeker in the unknown, if you like. My travels have taken me to the quiet stillness offered in this place to meet Stephen Knight and to unravel one of history's greatest and most macabre mysteries. This is a story which began in the English autumn of 1973 with that interview. Stephen Knight, the cover of the book is a little battered, but every well-read novel uh, is thus presented. I have poured over many a horror tale in my life and uh, gory mysteries, but the story of Jack the Ripper from those freezing days of the late 1880s has had many theories attached to it from criminologists to ordinary citizens and, of course, many other writers. But you presented a tale that I regard as the finest I have ever written. You embarked on a course that would take you through 18 months of mystery, intrigue, controversy, and a story that, once read, makes Watergate look like a, a Sunday school picnic, really, doesn't it? Mm, yes, it does, very much so. Um, I was researching for a year before I started to write, and then writing for six months while researching the latter part of the book. Hmm. Let's go back to the East End of London in the late 1880s. These were certainly not good times for anybody. It was a very bleak, horrifying place, especially for prostitutes who were selling their souls for, what, a penny or something. How much were, were they likely to make if they were lucky? Penny or tuppence a client, I suppose, in those days. Um, the price of a bed was fourpence, and for slightly less you could get a, a rope in a very, very seedy doss house, running alive with cockroaches. Uh, simply a rope strung along from, from a wall to another wall, and a dozen or so people would hang on it, you know, like that, and sleep My word. For the whole night. And that was luxury compared with what most of these poor women had. You, they were sleeping out of doors on most nights, and... Uh, under railway arches and anywhere they could find mm. some sort of shelter. Mm. 
Of course, let's now knock down one myth about our Jack. These women, A, were certainly not young, uh, and B, they were not in any shape or form pretty, the unfortunate victims. No, um, obviously, as you say, the, the average Hollywood representation is of a sort of music hall girl. These women were very much more degraded than that. Uh, they were in their 40s, most of them, and which meant in those days, with the sort of life they led, that they would have looked in their 60s at least. Mm. Uh, very haggard, very, very drunk, probably toothless, all of them, certainly. Some of them didn't have any teeth at all. Uh, they were really most unattractive-looking creatures. There were around 80,000 prostitutes working in London at that time. Mm. Yet, we are looking here, and we're going to look closely, at only five. Now, other writers have suggested, in fact, one writer suggested perhaps 20 victims. Other figures of six, seven, eight were attributed to the Ripper, but you say there were only five. Yes. Ripper victims. I'm not alone in saying that. Uh, Sir Melville McNaughton, who took over as assistant commissioner of, the Scotland, of Scotland Yard shortly after the Ripper murders ended, closed the, the Ripper file uh, with a report. And he stated in that file that the Whitechapel murderer had five victims and five victims only. Anyone has, who has delved at all deeply into the case since then has agreed with him on the medical evidence uh, alone, it is certain that uh, Jack the Ripper had no more than five victims. One writer suggested that he had only four because one of the victims uh, that this writer said uh, had her throat cut in the opposite direction from the other uh, victims. Uh, but I established from a previously undiscovered post-mortem report that this victim too, Elizabeth Stride, had her throat cut in exactly the same way. So, yes, it, it's definite that there were five victims and five victims only. Whitechapel victim number one, Mary Ann Nichols. She was in her 40s. She was very down at heel, much the worse for drink most of the time because... Well, as with all the victims, that was the only solace they could find in life, gin, and the, um, the comfort that drunkenness brought. Uh, she wasn't too badly dressed because she'd not that much earlier been given uh, clothing by the Lambeth workhouse. She'd led a very poor life and a very distressing life. She'd had a very bad time with her husband and she'd had children and she'd come from the Lambeth area and, and come to the East End and settled into prostitution. On the night of August the 31st, she was with a friend called Emily Holland, whom she last saw in, she, she was with her in Whitechapel at about one o'clock in the morning. She said goodbye to her. She was going off to find a client. Uh, and she said, look what a pretty bonnet I've got, or some such words as that. And she walked off towards Whitechapel Station. A few hours later, she was discovered in a doorway in Bucks Row, on the pavement, ritually laid out. Stephen, the words ritually laid out they become more and more important as this story unfolds, correct? Right, yes. Let's look at the victims. We just talked of Mary Nichols. Let's talk of her frightening injuries. It wasn't just a sweet killing. I mean, this woman was the first of five to be totally slaughtered. If we could look at a word, that would be it, wouldn't it? Yes, I mean, that's totally slaughtered in the sense that we're talking in the, in the context of the Ripper killing suggests she was at totally cut to pieces, which wasn't true. Uh, she was laid out and her intestines were sort of cut out and uh, there was a general mutilation in the genital area. Uh, her throat was cut from left to right. More detail than that we don't know because the 
newspapers didn't go into any more detail and the police and medical reports haven't survived. Uh, but it certainly was a very horrifying murder, but not nearly as horrifying as those which were to follow. At ten past six in the morning of September 8th, 1888, Inspector Joseph Chandler on duty at the Commercial Street Police Station was informed there had been another Whitechapel murder. This time, once again, a prostitute in her mid-forties, Anne Siffy, otherwise known as Annie Chapman. She again was laid out. At her feet were laid out several trinkets. There were two rings, two brass rings, laid side by side, and two mint-condition brass farthings laid edge to edge. And she was even more mutilated, uh, far more appalling injuries than Mary Nichols. She, her entrails were completely taken out, cut out of her, and her intestines were thrown over her shoulder. Her throat was cut so deeply that her head was almost severed from her body. Two victims in the one evening. His first, the gangling Swedish prostitute, once again 45 years old. She was known as Long Liz, Elizabeth Stride. Long Liz Stride was found murdered in a backyard or a courtyard adjoining the uh, a socialist club in Stepney, south of Commercial Road. Catherine Eddowes was discovered, as I say, 45 minutes later in Mitre Square, Aldgate. The first victim, Stride, the only injuries she had was a cut throat, which, as I said, has led some people to say she wasn't a ripper victim at all. Uh, her throat was cut from left to right. The second victim, Catherine Eddowes, was horribly cut about. Her, not only was her body cut about in the manner of Nichols and Chapman and her entrails thrown over the shoulder again but she was stabbed about the face cut very deliberately on the cheeks and her eyelids were slit and she also had her throat cut from left to right 